the visionary, the, the person who, um, who kind of says, let's, let's go there, you know, throws the hat over the wall. Um, and then there's the people that come around behind you that sort of support that vision. And Gina, as the deputy director of the DC chapter, has been the person who keeps me from falling flat on my face by saying, have you done this? Have you lined up those people? And so forth and really steps in uh, when I don't have the bandwidth to really do things. And I'm deeply grateful to her and to her husband, Hank, who's the timekeeper here. But he's behind her and letting her do all the things that she does. So Dina's going to be our moderator, and I'll turn it over to her, and she can. Good morning. My name is Gina Angiola. I'm um, a recovering physician and wannabe farmer and soil scientist. I've gotten really hooked on this. Chris is Chris in the room. I mean, her, her talks are just dynamite. And of course, Jim is what really hooked, a, hooked me into this whole topic. Um, so what we're going to do today is we have four panelists, Ed. Ed? Yes. We have four panelists who are actual farmers and are taking innovative approaches to food production. Um, they've been kind enough to let me visit each of their operations. And I'm like a kid in a candy store. I really love this stuff. So I'm hoping that. Each of them will take about five minutes to talk about what they're doing in their own operations, how it sort of ties in with the bigger picture we're talking about in terms of uh, restoration of ecosystems and regenerative agriculture. And also, this group, I think, will have a special perspective and ability to talk about some of the co-benefits. So, you know, one of the things we've mentioned is that foods these days are not as nutrient dense as they should be, and we need to change that. We know that farming appropriately can help with water management. It can help with um, community building. So in a, sh in, in, you know, in a nutshell, each person here has a different perspective to offer from urban um, agriculture to large farming operations. And I'm going to just say their names and where they work and let them do their own introductions. After they speak for their five minutes or so, we'll ask a I'll ask a couple of questions, and then it'll be open to the audience so you all can ask. Thank you. So this first speaker is Margaret Morgan Hubbard of EcoCity Farms. Hi, my name is Margaret. I am, um, yeah, EcoCity Farms is in Prince George's County, and I'm often appalled at how few people in the D.C. area know where Prince George's County is, since it's only about a mile and a half from here. Sit up. Do I stand? Stand? Would oh, do I have to? to? Um, yeah. Can I, can I stand there? Or? I just want to be able sure, to look at absolutely. some. So um, I'm not from this area originally. I'm from um, New York City. And I am the daughter, uh, and New York City is not really a big farming town, although it's become more, much more of an urban farming place now. But I am the daughter of um, Russian and um, Polish uh, refugees, Jewish refugees, uh, people who were not thrilled to come to this country because they were terrified of the racism in this country. And one of the things I wanted to do was to link some of um, what I've been working on because um, the racism is one of the big drivers for me about making change in this whole system. Um, and yesterday at the march, there was one of my favorite signs, and it said, white supremacy poisons the air we breathe. And it poisons the land we live on, and it poisons our entire country. And um, I have been, I worked at EPA for um, five years during the Clinton administration. I was the director of the Office of Communications. And um, during that time, I um, was told by almost everyone at EPA that the environmental movement is white. And um, every time I tried to bring people of color, they said, we can't have them speak because they don't represent. And it won't play well in Peoria. I don't know why that was an obsession of theirs. And so I want to say that um, that's crazy and that far too many rooms that I've been in recently and um, I can't believe that that's still true, um, are predominantly white when we talk about the environment or we talk about food or we talk about change. And I think that this is part, not only 
Um, it, if we're going to restore the environment, we also have to um, increase social justice, and we have to increase the mix of people who are working on the environment. Um, so that's one of the things I think is really important that we all understand because every culture and every people have a tremendous amount to contribute and the people who are new immigrants who have lived closer to the land than many of the people who have lived here forever know more than we do and we need them. So that's something I wanted to say. I also want to say that um, when I moved, when I first came to this area from New York, I lived in... Um, Bethesda and then uh, at a friend's house and then eventually I uh, moved to Washington DC and then um, to Prince George's County and those of you who don't know Prince George's County is 90% non-white. That also used to be true largely of DC. It was certainly more than 50% non-white and this whole area is changing significantly. But um, the fact that Prince George's County is predominantly non-white means many other things as well. As I moved from Bethesda to DC to Prince George's, what I found is that there was a lot more life in Prince George's. And I'm not just talking about people, I'm also talking about bugs and living things. I mean, I really um, was amazed at the differences I saw because uh, Montgomery County uses all kinds of um, lawn care products and other things and the, the life in Montgomery County um, has been um, eradicated and so I mean I was really shocked at how many more bugs I saw everywhere in Prince George's County. That was the first thing I saw as being different. Um, I've spent my life fixing other people's messes and I'm really good at it. And I've gotten many jobs because I'm a fixer and um, finally I decided that I was going to fix my own mess by starting it and creating it and so on. And part of creating um, Eco City Farms is about um, acknowledging that human beings are not consumers, we're creators. And we not only are um, creators but we're doers and thinkers and we have to integrate our body and our, our bodies and our minds to be able to actually move forward. That far too many of us only use our minds on, um, as a, you know, in 24 seven, we use only, we don't um, act out and try to create something physically with our hands and the rest of us. So uh, I think that that's a critical impetus for building eco city farms. Now most of the food deserts in, in, in this area, um, inside the Capitol Beltway, which is where our farm is, we're really only about a mile and a half from here. But those things that are called food deserts, most of them are in Prince George's County. And so that was part of the other reason why I wanted to create a farm in Prince George's County. I've been an environmentalist my whole life. Um, I really felt that um, it was time to replace lawns with food. And it was time for us to really take charge of not only um, ourselves, but our food system. And so um, in, I, I started Eco City Farms in 2010, but long before 2010, for 10 years, I worked at the University of Maryland, and I started creating um, urban farms there. Um, the only problem is that they didn't want to pay for them, and that, that's not basically what the School of Agriculture was about and so I was fighting, which I think that that's one thing that all of us understand. If we wanna make change, we're constantly fighting something, someone, and, um, and the system that really wants to stay as it is. So um, I wanna say that when I thought we were, when I first started building the farm, I thought it was build the farm and um, you know people would come, that, that there would be food and suddenly it would solve some of the problems of lack of access to food. Um, I also thought that if we were dealing with urban farms, what was below the soil wasn't as much of an issue because we'd grow and raise beds. And um, certainly from the beginning, um, uh, composting and vermicomposting was a major part of our, of our um, idea of what we had to do. We had to enrich the soil by turning all waste into um, meaningful soil additives. And that what is um, more abundant in um, 
an urban setting than waste. So we really had a wonderful fit between wa food waste and other waste and our farm. Also, almost everything on our farm is built um, with recycled materials. And it's really important to us to create a farm that can be re reproduced. So we, um, even, we're a nonprofit. We're a nonprofit not because we didn't want to make money, but because I didn't have any. And so all the investments had to be from begging and borrowing and <laughs> however I could. Um, I originally thought we would buy land, but I was told after I found the piece of land and so on, I was told by the county that they would never permit hoop houses or other things on um, residential land. And so after fighting that over and over again, first with 10 planners in the room, then with 20, and finally with 50 people from the planning um, office in the room with me, they finally said, this woman's never going to go away. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just give her county land. So our farm is on county land. And um, they gave me a one-year lease. We built the farm. And then um, we, we ended up getting a grant that said you had to have at least 15 years. So they extended the lease for 15 years. And then we built a second farm on um, a low-income housing project where um, where there was a piece of land that they had to leave idle in order to um, comply with zoning regulations and have it less dense. And um, there's been tremendous challenges. We got the land, we got all the agreements, we made it public, and then they said, you can't grow on this land. We won't let you grow on this land. So we had to change zoning um, to do so. Every piece of doing change that's important whether it's, um, I mean, and, and even if it seems trivial, because when I started being an environmentalist, um, I, I thought of myself as a social justice activist, and, when I, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm selling out, I'm working on the environment, and those, that's going to be an easy fix. And um, we, you know, since then, we found out that fighting big oil, fighting big interests is much harder. It's harder than eradicating apartheid in South Africa. But both are critical to our survival. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Ed Hewling from New Day Forums. Do you want to stand or do you want to talk? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I've been obsessed with protecting the environment and human health and nutrition for most of my adult, uh, adult life. And so it's great to uh, share, be here with uh, people with similar aspirations. Um, so uh, my company is New Day Farms. And we uh, grow an entirely in a greenhouse now. We're 100% we're organic. And we grow um, organic salad greens that we sell at Whole Foods and, and uh, Mom's Organic Market. Um, <coughs> What I'd like to share here is, is uh, starting with, um, it, given my concern with human nutrition over decades, uh, I began to be really concerned with uh, whether our food really has the nutritional value that we need. And as you've heard other places here, it's, I, I'm certainly not alone in that suspicion. Um, but long story short, I had the opportunity to spend a year at the Department of Agriculture, the research station. Um, researching growing plants in different soil, testing mineral content, <coughs> um, and doing a lot of research in the National Agriculture Library. And so while my plants were growing, I was interested to – what I really wanted to know was is, you know, h how nutritious were foods 50 years ago, 75 or even 100 years ago. And, and uh, it, it took me months. <laughs> um, but basically the, the – the two central things that I learned uh, during my time there is, number one, that the composition uh, and the properties of soil make an enormous difference to the nutritional value of the food that's grown on them. And as, as I'm sure you can see from a lot of the slides we've seen, the, um, the, 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 the properties of soil have declined enormously uh, over the past real to some extent since agriculture began, more aggressively since industrial agriculture. In particular, uh, per, uh, as I think you've also heard here, the, 
what I found was that the, the biggest single uh, determinant of food nutritional value was organic content in the soil. And depending on where you are in the country, um, you know, we started out it, with tip, m most areas of the country with maybe 10 percent soil organic matter. And on most farms in the U.S. today, it's less than 1 percent. So it's been a dramatic difference of the central ingredient for nutritional value. But as you all, we're all learning is all that soil carbon has also been oxidized and now contributing to the climate change issue. So, so we have two central issues um, on the nutrition side in parallel with this, you know, 100-year acceleration of the loss of soil carbon. We have a skyrocketing uh, incidence of cancer and other degenerative diseases and a skyrocketing cost of health care. So even in the past, um, <clears throat> even since 1980, um, the cost for health care in this country was around $200 billion. Today it's $3 trillion. So that's just in, you know, in 30 to 40 years. And so as, you're, as we're seeing the decline, obviously there are many issues to do with nutrition and, pack and processed foods and, and poor diets. But Underlying them all is the loss of, of mineral content, loss of nutrient content in our foods, and that really is driven both by, um, by the way that we farm and by the loss of, of, of organic content in the soil, which holds on to water and minerals, and the loss of what contributes to, to plant nutritional value and food nutritional value. So, um, so obviously I'm... <laughs> When I didn't get any, uh, anyone interested at the Department of Agriculture in taking these issues seriously back 16 or 17 years ago, I got frustrated and said, well, I'll just go start farming myself. And I, have n I had no farming background. And uh, it turns out that farming and growing nutritious food and restoring soil was a whole lot harder than anything I could ever have imagined. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't want to whitewash the thing. but. Um, but it is possible, and, um, and it, it is possible to restore the organic content in soil. It's possible to have dramatically more mineral availability to plants um, and, and have uh, m more nutritious food. And at the same time, obviously, you put the carbon back in soil, and we're basically solving an environmental problem as well. So that's kind of what I'm up to. Thank you. So when I said recovering physician, part of my complaint with the medical system is that we treat disease with pharmaceuticals and we don't support health and prevent illness. So this is why this really all ties together and I find it very exciting. These are my heroes. Our next speaker is Cleo Braver from Cottingham Farms in Eastern, on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Thank you, sorry. Jumped the gun a little. I just, so hold the mic real close to your like that? Is it okay if I get lipstick on it? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't in a, 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 a second-generation farmer either. I'm first-generation. I have the hands to show that I'm actually doing the work myself. I was an environmental lawyer and advocate in my first life, and I came to farming because I couldn't find anybody else to farm our farm the way I wanted it farmed. I'm on the eastern shore. I'm in the, I'm a, in this, in a sea of conventional, large-scale grain agriculture which is just really heavy with synthetic fertilizers, with pesticides, with herbicides, with fungicides. Um, it's, you know, American corn is the number one use of atrazine, I think, on the planet Earth. And uh, it's banned in most parts of the, of the world it, because of its links to breast and prostate cancer. Delmar was also the number one, one of the leading cancer clusters in the country for both those cancers. It's, it's, um, it's not bucolic and lovely and wonderful when you pass these fields. You should think of ADHD and reproductive and endocrine disorders and breast and prostate cancer. There's nothing lovely about Eastern Shore farming for the most part. Um, and here's just one little statistic. Less than 2.5% of Maryland cropland, not farmland, is in vegetables and fruits. It's all, it's all grain to feed CAFO animals, which are confined animal feed operations. Um, so. You know, I asked our farmer to start doing things a little more sustainably, to put in buffer strips, to put in cover crops. 
No. And so we, we, he said, and you're not going to find anybody else who's willing to do it either. So 10 years ago, nine years ago, I said, I guess I have to stop being a lawyer and start being a farmer. So we went from being gentlemen farmers to farmers. Um, and, you know, I don't have such a cushy life anymore. <laughs> um, so the first thing we did was we put in um, about 50 acres of environmental practices. They're federally funded. There's no reason not to do them. They're CRP and CREP programs. The dollars are there because the feds at least recognize the value of it. Um, and they're just not at all utilized on the Chesapeake Bay. They're just, you're, you, see, you, don't, you go down the roads and you see the ditches and you see the farm land, the, 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 the soy and the, beet and, the, uh, and the corn is farmed right up to the ditches, which are designed to carry five tons an acre of sediment every year and, and, and nitrogen and phosphorus and water just straight to the Chesapeake Bay. And it does it really, really well. Um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, so we started farming. We started with, the, with, the, with, with putting up the buffer strips. And then um, uh, the, we happen to have a nonprofit, Chesapeake Wildlife Heritage, who puts those buffer strips in and maintains them. So it doesn't cost you anything. And then the quail come back. We did a 20-acre wetland. There's all kinds of shorebirds in there. Um, so it's really beautiful. The farm was transformed. We had four foot deep erosion ditches in our cornfields, um, and and uh, those have now gone away. Um, we are now doing organic vegetables. We're certified organic in the USDA program. It's only one organic program. MDA is our certifier, uh, and we then integrated animals. So we've had animals for three years. We integrated them with the vegetables, and so we're starting to see Mother Nature partner with us. Um, it's really nice to see the difference on our on our farm. We've taken organic matter from less than half a percent to um, five, six, seven percent, um, actually higher. Well, it depends on how you do it and how quickly. Um, so it, there's there's we learned a lot about that too. We have issues <laughs> in, in in the high tunnels. Um, this is we're trying to reform the food system. You know, if we just change the way we grow food here, we can really change public health, both the, the outcomes and, and the cost of our, of our public health system. We can really improve the environment. I started farming because I was convinced by the science that it was this kind of farming that was going to save the Chesapeake Bay. And I do not think I'm wrong. Um, but I think people don't really care enough about the environment, so we shifted our message to the public health, you know, like let's get rid of the, the breast and prostate cancer. The, you know, not causation, they've shown a link between the two, not, not causation. But those are serious public health consequences, I think. Um, we can create jobs on farms. This is very labor intensive. Our big input is jobs, which I think is a good thing. Um, it is not synthetics and, and, and pollutants and carcinogens. We can improve food access. In fact, you know, we import the vast majority of our food uh, from Canada and Mexico and from Maryland, from Florida and California. And we can really rebuild community resilience and not just create jobs. Just in the state of Maryland, we can create a couple of billion with a B dollar economy. And I think the policymakers should be interested in that. Um, what we need to have it have those things happen is we either have to have enlightened lawmakers. I don't know. <laughs> I used to work in the political system, and I ain't going there anymore. Um, you guys can do it. You guys can do it three times a day every time you wield a fork. You can completely, literally, figuratively change the landscape. Maybe not in one growing season, but in two growing seasons, you'd start to see a difference. If everybody wakes up and stops eating grocery store CAFO meat that are fed grain, um, you can change the system. It's all that corn, all that soy goes away when you start eating pastured animals. And the pasturing of the animals has this immense benefit um, of it, it turns this horrible thing from a liability into an asset to fertilize the fields in an even basis rather than having this massive amount of untreated manure, which exceeds the human manure in this country, which is required to be treated. Um, you, got, you guys can change it. And on top of that, it's, you know, the, the science is starting to say, forget about the power plant emissions and the car emissions. It's the soil you know, that's going to sequester all of our carbon and reverse um, global warming. So. Uh, it, 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 you can do that. You actually have the power to reverse climate change um, by voting with your fork three times a day. And, and I exhort folks to you know, ask 
not just where is my food raised, because there's a huge movement to push local. And here's what I want to ask you. If you go from buying conventional Canadian food to buying conventional Maryland food, what, what are you doing? <laughs> You're increasing the pesticide load in your own community. Not that it's good to shove it to another community, but you need to think about that. It's not just where it's grown, it's how it's grown. In fact, that's by far the most important equation. The where only deals with the reducing the 1,500 food miles traveled of the average food on your plate, 1,200 for fresh food. Um, really, li literally fresh food travels 1,200 miles. It's not so fresh. Um, you know, the, the, so the, so the how and the where are super important, so I exhort consumers to ask, ask that question three times a day. The other thing is, you know, the carbon sequestration credit rules are being written right now. So you guys need to get involved not only as eaters, you guys need to get involved as advocates because right now in the state of Maryland and many other states like Vermont and uh, California, they're writing the rules of what healthy soil is. Why are they writing the rules of what healthy soil is? Because they care about healthy soil or because they want to get the carbon credits once those markets are established? Mm -hmm. Question. Um, I do not want healthy soils definitions to reward farmers who use synthetic inputs and carcinogens um, just because they precision inject those. Um, I do not want the healthy soils rules to be written for guys who just do no-till and nothing else. Organic farmers do have one thing to do to clean up their act. A lot of the guys, including some here, have already done it. I'm moving toward doing um, no-till from low-till. And the big conventional commodity guys have to make a change. They do the, they get the no-till down, but they got to move forward on the, you know, getting rid of the synthetic inputs. We are not going to have. We'll talk to Kristen about it, but I do not believe we're going to have healthy soils unless we have both of those things. So, all agriculture has to make some massive changes in how they do things, and the public has to insist on it. And you have to support the farmers who are really working hard to do things right. And I got to say. We're not supported right now. We're not. People don't want to drive the extra four miles to pick up their pasture pork and their eggs and their organic vegetables. Well, it took me six months to grow them. I drove two and a half hours to an animal welfare approved slaughterhouse instead of the horrible one 20 minutes away from my farm. So I'm making three, tr three five hour trips, one to bring the animals, one to bring the fresh meat back to restaurants, and the third one to bring the frozen meat that's packaged for retail sale. Don't tell me you don't want to drive four miles to pick up that meat that I've been working really hard growing for you. I mean, I got to say, in the wintertime, we're going out three times a day to punch ice, punch holes in the ice so they can drink. We're going out in the heat three, four times a week to make fresh wallows for our pigs. We're rotating them every week to new pasture. It's hard work. Now, I'm not the best farmer on the planet. Like I said, I was a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure these three farmers are better than I am right now. Um, I'm going to pass you one of these days. But, you know, it's still really super hard work, and we, we, need your, we, need, we really need your support. You know, I'm an inadvertent nonprofit. <laughs> okay. Oh, the last, just the one thing, neonics. Here's the other way you help farmers who are trying, well, any farmer, including conventional. Please do not buy conventional seeds and plants. The majority of seeds now sold in this country for many things, including Crimson clover are crops that are for the neonics. Plants labeled bee-friendly, they're soaked with neonicotinoids, which will kill every pollinator that visits it. And just because you don't see a pile of dead bees at the bottom of your plant doesn't mean you didn't do it. It's a non-lethal non dose, so it just kind of takes them a few weeks of eating that stuff to not get back. And we've been devastated by huge 18-acre conventional sunflower fields near us where folks go to hunt you know, dove three, ti three times a year. And it just is taking our pollinators with it. So please, the organic regi regime is meaningful. Among a gazillion other things, it's protected me from inadvertently using neonic treated seeds. What was safe three years ago, two years ago, even one year ago, is no longer safe. 80% of sunflowers sold in, the, in, the, in this country are treated with neonics that will kill every pollinator. And I mean bats, bees, butterflies, everything. All right, sorry. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. So before we go to our last speaker, I just want to ask how many people in the audience have ever farmed? Just so we have some idea. Okay. Great. Thanks. Interesting information.
Hi, I'm Nick Maraville, organic farmer from Maryland. I was going to ask the same question, so I'm glad you know. I'm glad you asked it. Um, um, I wanted to thank all the volunteers who put this conference together. It is really fantastic. And um, I wanted to uh, make an observation. I hope this is just the first of a collaboration with Steptoe and Johnson, because we need everybody to be pulling in the same direction. Uh, this is a very influential firm and could be helpful in doing that. Um, when I talked to the uh, organizers of the conference, uh, they went over what they wanted me to cover, the various topics, and I said, that's a two-day conference. And they said, oh, yes, and by the way, you have five minutes. Um, how many people were on the march yesterday to save the Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, that's what we need uh, uh, to have and to have more of. At the end of my little presentation, I am going to take uh, the opportunity to ask you to take an action today uh, to help enlighten our lawmakers, uh, one that will have far-reaching effect. Uh, um, Okay, let me uh, t just tell you a little bit about my uh, farming experience of uh, four decades of organic farming. Um, and uh, I have uh, uh, generally, uh, 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 you saw uh, uh, Dr. Nichols' presentation, I have used both the uh, legume-based and the manure-based, only I, they're, they're substantially different from what was going on at the Rodale uh, Institute. I had more legumes and a longer rotation on my legume-based system. And <clears throat> I don't tend to bring in manure and spread it. Uh, I, I tend to integrate multi-species multi grazing, so the animals spread the manure. But um, I've been using those types of systems uh, for about 40 years. They work. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the bottom line uh, message. Where uh, I am farming now just at one location. I used to have two locations. And uh, uh, we raise uh, grass-fed beef. Oh, we're certified organic. We raise grass-fed beef. We raise uh, chickens and turkeys. And we raise uh, eggs. We also raise um, seed stock. So non-GMO corn seed, non-GMO uh, soybean seed and uh, uh, various types of uh, small grains sometimes we also put out as, as uh, seed stock. Um, we also have a feed business where we grind uh, uh, feed for uh, other farms and uh, back people with backyard flocks and um, uh, we uh, uh, use the grain that we grow on our own farm to grind that feed. We also use the feed for our own poultry. Um, our our uh, beef never get uh, any, uh, any grain. Um, I started out as a vegetable farmer. Now I would be considered an integrated crop and livestock farmer. The word integrated is key there. A lot of American agriculture, you're either crop or you're livestock. And uh, a lot of the programs that are out there in USDA uh, they can't handle you if you do both. Uh, the food safety regulations can't handle you if you do both. Uh, that's the way agriculture was, and that's the way agriculture will be in the, in the, in the future. It will be an integrated. Uh, and integration is key to the concept of biodiversity. Um, now, you can do it without animals, and I had for over 30 years um, uh, on my other location. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's a different technique, and uh, without getting too philosophical, uh, it involves time. Uh, so how much time and effort, and how fast do you want to speed things up? Uh, on the other hand, how do you want to manage it? So there are trade-offs everywhere, uh, everywhere you go into that. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about um, what I, um, you know, I'm a carbon farmer, okay? That's when people ask me what sort of a farmer are you. I'm a carbon farmer. I have been for 40 years. Right? That's what all farmers need to be. Um, now, what I'm looking for is the long-term stability of my soil and the resiliency in the soil. And the long-term stability is related uh, to making the carbon stick around longer, making longer 
chains, bigger molecules of the carbon, called building soil humus. Um, and the, the resiliency is the ability to withstand shock. So if I get a dry year, I get a wet year, I get uh, a uh, one-off uh, insect uh, invasion, all of these sorts of things, my soil is resilient. Um, I once had a five-inch rain event in an hour and a half and my open ground, what we call open ground, is ground that's not in sod, but might be in, let's say, corn or soybeans, something like that. It, it held. I didn't get any erosion. Five inches in an hour and a half. Now, you, you don't normally get that, but that's a shock to the system. And you get that because of the way you manage your soil. Um, the traditional uh, measures of soil health and viability are uh, soil structure, water permeability, and topsoil erosion. Those are things that are mechanically easy to measure um, if you're with the USDA's uh, NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service. It doesn't tell the whole story. The story is what Dr. Nichols was telling us about. The story is what's living in the soil. Uh, these are indicators of when you really got a problem, uh, you're going to find those are, are, are issues. Um, and so um, what we're really doing is we're looking for ways to get that soil life as diverse as possible so that it has the ability to interact with plants and animals up above the surface um, so that we get long-lasting carbon that will not dissipate easily. Well, again, without going into the details, there's all sorts of fractions of soil organic carbon. Some of it is going to be here for a month. Some is going to be here for a year. Some will be here for millennia. And so we're trying to get, and, and by the way, you need all those types. You don't need just one type of that soil carbon. But if you're killing the life in your soil, the chances of keeping the longer lasting carbon starts to go down um, a lot. Um, let me just uh, speak a little bit about um, the nutrient um, uh, value of, of, of the uh, crops and the animals that come off. We do this, we have a farm tour every year, and we do this with our as our public education. But for example, we produce beef. You cut that beef and you put it on the counter before you cook it. If you do that with conventional beef, you leave it out for an hour or two, it starts to turn brown. It's oxidized. Um, you do it with our beef, it doesn't turn brown. That's because it's high in, in vitamin E or tocopherols. It's an antioxidant. It's part of what they get from eating grass and not eating grain. Also, you'll notice the color is in the fat is, is, is a little creamy. It got a little bit of yellow in it. Again, that's because of the beta carotenes. You can actually see it. Then, you know, I'm sitting there having dinner, coming in and out of the field, the phone rings, and people calling up and saying, I just had one of your hamburgers, and it is absolutely delicious. We didn't put any salt or pepper or anything on it. You know, this is really great stuff. Yeah, yeah. It tastes different. It tastes better, all right? So uh, the fat also is more watery. It doesn't leave that, oh, I just have uh, the inside of my mouth coated with a greasy substance. It's higher in omega-3s and CLAs. So there is a real difference. We've had universities come out and study it. We've also been a site because we used to uh, uh, conduct on-farm research with USDA and the land grants. Um, our eggs. One of the things we do is we buy, we go to the store and buy organic eggs and put the cartons out and then we take a carton and mix organic eggs and the customers are there and say, you know, at our farm tour, and just crack it open in a clear bowl and say, look at that egg. Now look at these eggs. Which one do you want to buy? That egg. You can see the difference. It's a deep orange color. Then people buy the eggs and they come back to us and they say, if we can't get your eggs, we don't want to eat eggs anymore. We want your eggs. 
They taste different. They feel different. Um, our corn, we, we grow uh, food grade corn and food grade soybeans, but we also grow field corn. But our food grade corn is based upon the genetics of the Native American corns, and they are Native American corns. One comes from Italy and got lost in the United States, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, whoop, whoops. Uh, but, but it was re rediscovered in Italy. Well, it's got more protein. The point is, the Indians didn't survive on um, corn chips, <laughs> pure <laughs> carbohydrate without any nutrient value. They survived. Th these corns have probably got close to double the protein content and a lot of the, the trace elements and, and minerals. Uh, when you cook these, uh, they're a little bit harder. Well, that's the presence of protein. Uh, they're not all soft and mushy. So uh, you can see this in everything we do. We do three different types of, of uh, corns. So let me just give you some of the principles here, and I'm, I'll move along. I'll move along. I, I mean, you know, know this is <clears throat> two-day conference you're getting here in five minutes, so. <laughs> um, eight minutes, yep, yep well, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. So um, some of the things that I do uh, just as a matter of course, and, I, and I'll just point out here, people say to me, well, what's the most important thing in organic farming? And I say, well, th there is no one most important thing. Every little thing is important in its own way. We heard that earlier uh, uh, from Dr. Lowry. Uh, it's all c interconnected. So here are some of the things I do that are interconnected. Uh, Reduce tillage. You betcha we reduce tillage. We use shallow cultivation, vertical cultivation. We use no-till. We have uh, all of my equipment is set up for uh, uh, no-till, uh, my planters and my, and my drills. Uh, you need to keep roots alive all the time. You don't want to go in and spray with Roundup and say, well, you know, we had a cover crop there. We spray with Roundup. We kill it. You know, the ground's covered. Stop soil erosion. Okay. But you're not giving any vital environment for the soil to live. So on our farm, we try to have living roots in the soil 100% of the time. There are one to two months a year where approximately 20% of our farm may not have a full complement of roots. We've taken a crop down, and we're putting a new crop in, and you need time to get reestablished. But we want active roots all winter long, all summer long, all the time. Um, w I won't speak uh, to this. There's, there's a whole, in any detail, but you need to integrate animals with plants or animals and crops. Um, you need to keep the soil covered, and that's cover crops and managing your organic residues. And there's all sorts of ways to do that. But we've been doing it all these years. Uh, you need to um, take previously living organic matter, whether it's, whether it's uh, just, just the uh, residue of your crops, whether it's compost. And you need to fix carbon. People don't think about this, but you're actually drawing carbon out of the air and fixing it and putting it into your soil. For a long time, farmers have been thinking about this in terms of nitrogen with the rhizobia bacteria, et cetera. But that's essentially what, car uh, what carbon farming um, uh, is, is about. And uh, as you do that, your soil becomes more productive, and you get denser yields, and you get more nutrient-dense food from your crops, from your plants, and from your animals. Uh, you need to reduce off-farm fertility inputs as much as you can. You're trying to maximize your soil. You do have to bring things in occasionally. Um, we tend to do that by feeding minerals to our animals and having the animals spread it around. But sometimes, well, for example, we do spread lime, which is calcium and magnesium. Uh, we have sped, spread rock pot powders pri uh, for both phosphorus and uh, potassium. Um, by rotating your animals through your 
fields, and by rotating your fields between crops and pasture land, um, you're also um, uh, not drawing the same minerals and the same nutrient needs out of the soil at all the same time. You're giving both the organic uh, uh, life in the soil and the soil itself a, a chance to catch up and rejuvenate. Uh, and then you need to emphasize biodiversity. We, uh, we plant multiple species at the same time. I mean, sometimes we'll have four or five species that we're planting at the same time. We're planting annuals into standing perennials. We're planting perennials into standing annuals. We're not destroying the surface. We're planting into the surface. We want that diversity. Uh, in a dry year, certain things are favored. In a, in a wet year, certain other things are favored. Uh, the diversity is, is nature's insurance. Um, uh, and let me just see. OK. <laughs> Most of these principles have been practiced for many centuries of recorded agricultural history. Because they are all part of a natural system, they were just not stated explicitly because humans lived closer to nature and did not question it. So we've, we're coming full circle, and hopefully the circle is good. Now, um, what action could you take? Uh, I boiled this down to a Google event. Go to organicfarmersassociation.org. It's outside. Okay, now outside I've, I've uh, actually put slightly different words so you can save yourself a click. But if you go to organicfarmersassociation.org, this is a new organization. I'm, uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm a founding steering committee member of it. It's national. It's a it's a, it's a, a project sponsored by the Rodale Institute. This is will be and is right now the only organization controlled by family organic farmers. One farmer, one vote. Money doesn't talk here. And it's the way to get a voice for the people who are doing what I just described. The farm bill is coming up in 2018. We're going to enlighten our lawmakers. We're going to have uh, an organization that's going to be able, basically, to speak truth to power. The Freedom Caucus has singled out the organic legislation as needing major reform. Translation is not corporate enough. So there are ways to put an organic label on something, and you don't get the benefits that I just described of 40 years of farming. We, the farmers, want to speak up. We need your support. There are only about 14,000, 15,000 organic farmers right now in the United States. But we need to have our voice heard. We need to be a player at the table. There's no national organization where only farmers control the policy position. There are national organizations do a great jobs. Some of them are sitting. I, I know you're right here, right? And we're all working together. But the voice of the farmer needs to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Nick from Nick's Organic Farm.